oligarchs, internet entrepreneurs, new money billionaires are springing up faster than ever before. And with new money come brash new attitudes. Wealth now doesn't mean 40, 50, 60 million. It means in the billions. Generation Hyper Rich has arrived. It's kind of blingy and more out there than it used to be. It's like, you've got a 300-foot yacht, oh, but he's got a 500-foot yacht. Now you've got status anxiety. You have the old money versus the new money. The individuals spending here, there and everywhere on everything bling and everything showy. Billionaires are the new celebrity. And just like celebrities, many new money billionaires are not afraid to be seen to be extravagant. And they want grand, iconic toys that scream, check me out. Seems they've checked a box which says yacht or plane or stud farm or mini stately home. If they have no background of being rich or not the etiquette or the finesse, I think it can become very, very stressful. Well, there is a disorder now that they've coined is called acquired situational narcissism. Middle class people, just like you and me, become billionaires overnight. They're becoming you know, obscenely vain and, and drunk on their own self-importance. They want to show that they belong. So that's when people start competing amongst, you know, who's got their children at the best schools, who's got the more expensive handbags, who's got the prettier wife, who's got the better looking children, which is an awful thing to say. And who, of course, has got the most outrageous gin palace on the med? This is the world of billionaire toys. Monaco in July is a mecca for mega yachts, and it's a chance for their owners to measure up against their fellow billionaires. Floating villas, mobile palaces, or ego-boosting phallic symbols, they all shout, that's right, I rule. Ten years ago, we had the haves and the have yachts. But now we have the haves and the have giga yachts. And we have the rich, the super rich, and the ultra rich. To join this ultra exclusive club, you'd better have plenty of the folding stuff. To be able to purchase a yacht, you've got to have at least between 30 and 60 million pounds. So that's your first cost, which is obviously enormous. And then you're more than likely, if you're that type of person who can afford to buy a yacht, you'll want it refurbished as well. So that's looking at at least another probably four or five million pounds, if not a lot more than that. The running costs to fund your own yacht, they really do cost astronomical amounts of money. Running costs are the old hidden nemesis of every boat owner. There's an old adage that, you know, you should rent anything that flies, floats and fornicates. It costs a fornicating amount of money just to keep your tub in the water, and then you've got to fill her up. We use about 1,500 litres of fuel an hour, and we have a capacity of about seven hours of fuel. So every time we go at the gas station, uh, we have to put about 40,000 euros down. 40,000 euros every seven hours. It's a rude awakening to even the most gung-ho of new money billionaires. It's one thing buying a mega yacht, but at the highest echelons of showiness, that's simply not enough. What sets the hyper-wealthy apart is their ability to build a new yacht to their own specification. And when you're that rich, you can have whatever you want. Well, within reason. We had one client's wife who was wondering whether we would keep a pony on a boat uh, for her daughter. The idea was to have an exercising turntable at the back of the yacht on the aft deck. But they weren't embarrassed to ask the question. They thought it was a reasonable question to invite. Well, I think it's fair to say they live in a totally different world. They are increasingly living in a bubble. And I suppose the ideal lifestyle for a member of the super rich is James Bond crossed with the Bond villain. We also had a client that wanted to have a shark tank, you know, like a, um, a swimming pool but with sharks in it. Well, the swimming pool would be half shark, half human, with a glass wall between the two. Again, I didn't think that would be very kind to the sharks. Employing specialist naval architects like Ed Dubois or Tim Haywood doesn't come cheap, and that's just the point. No one needs a yacht. Uh, you, it's the very last thing you need, actually. If you want to see your money actually just vanishing into thin air, you buy a yacht. Why not? If you're worth eight billion, you know, and you spend 300 million in a yacht, it's not a lot of money. 
Every super yacht is a one-off creation, designed and built with extraordinary craftsmanship. I think of them, I hope it's not uh, sacrilegious, I, I think of them almost as being today's cathedrals. Um, the cathedrals of the, of the Middle Ages were the most sophisticated things on Earth. I think now yachts are. Amel's shipyard in Holland is where nautical dreams come to life. British yacht designer Tim Hayward has come here to see his latest beer moth take shape. It is remarkable to see this boat today, having spent the hours drawing it. It's a 66-metre yacht, built over three tiers, and the price, well, eye-watering. On average now, we talk about kind of a million euros a metre. Yes, that is indeed around 66 million euros, just for the build. The whole of the outside is hand-sanded, the whole thing. You know, the paint job alone for that boat is going to be two, three million euros. And that's just for the outside. For the interior design, he'll spend many millions more to furnish his fantasy. They want the latest gadget, but, they've, but, but they want them for things like in films. They want that awful expression, the James Bond factor. They want all those sort of wow things. Unreal life made real. So the big TV screen is there. So if you want to have everybody on the big long sofa watching a movie, you can do it like that. On the other hand, if you want to look outside, sorry, um, you can turn the whole thing back again. So money really does make the world go round. Finally, you're ready to weigh anchor and get showy. A yacht is for every owner a weapon of show off. They want their yacht to be the biggest and it causes them genuine pain. When, when some other dude's yacht comes in and it's bigger than theirs, they feel they failed, even though they've got an enormous sized yacht. These boats are, you know, how big? How big do you want it? I mean... It's the, the status thing, I think. I think it's much more sexually driven than that. I think, I think it's all rather silly, but whatever. Right there will always be someone else with a bigger yacht than you. I mean, I know there are a couple of fashion billionaires. When their yachts were together in Saint-Tropez, literally the other screamed across the water, mine's bigger than yours, mine's bigger than yours. It's a, it's a bit of a cockfight. <laughs> well, let's see those nautical cocks and get fighting. Here are the world's current top five giga yachts. At number five, Topaz weighs in around 12,000 tons and stretches 147 meters. At number four, Al Said, built for the royal family of Oman, measures 155 meters, accommodates 70 passengers and 154 crew members. Dubai, at number three, was originally commissioned by big spending Prince Geoffrey of Brunei. In 1996, construction ground to a halt due to lack of funds. Five years later, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum finished the job in style. It's estimated that Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich's eclipse cost him nearly one billion dollars. Rumored to have its own intruder detecting system and anti-paparazzi laser shield, it's just the ticket for a Roman holiday. Once the biggest yacht in the world, it shrank in 2013 when an even bigger fish splashed into the pond. Launched in April 2013, Azam is this year's top of the yachts, and most yacht spotters reckon it's the plaything of the Emir of Abu Dhabi. This 94,000 horsepower vessel travels at more than 30 knots, which makes it not only the longest, but the fastest super yacht in the world. Coming up, Playtime in Paradise, the ultimate high-end toys for new money billionaires left out in the cold. Just because you're super rich doesn't mean the super rich accept you. There is this isolation that billionaires have to endure. And staffing the super toys billionaire style. If you're a size 12 to 14, it's very difficult to do your job. The last thing they want to see is somebody that's frumpy. Newly made billionaires have got it bad. Decked out with brand new showpiece toys, they're finally into high society, except it's not necessarily the nirvana of their dreams. 
A billionaire spends his whole life trying to accumulate wealth to escape society. And then when he gets there, he spends his whole time trying to re-ingratiate himself back into society. There is this isolation that uh, billionaires uh, have to endure. Just because you're super rich doesn't mean the super rich accept you. Because the pecking order amongst the super rich is quite stratified. So on the top of the super rich league are the extremely well-educated, well-spoken, art enthusiastic um, sophisticates. They do not feel that they are the same as the next super rich guy who owns three yachts but can't pull a sentence together. Your new old money pals don't deem you worthy, so what do you do? You head back to your trusty friends from the good old days. I mean, the idea that, you know, you've been invited on someone's yacht, yippee. Um, first of all, you're expected to leave 10% of the cost of the yacht in tips, which, by the way, is more than flying around the world first class. On top of that, the men who come and take the little boat that takes you, shuffles you back and forth from the yacht, they expect to be tipped as well. So actually, unless you're very rich, you can't afford to be a guest of someone who's very rich. I think the unspoken contract between the host and the guest is that the guest is there in some way to entertain the host and the other guests. And you've got to play the game. You've got to be part of the fun and, you know, sing for your supper. I was once having lunch with a, a billionaire. He said something very amusing, which was that when you invite friends on, on your super yacht, they take everything in the room. They basically walked out with the entire contents. To hell with your friends. You're a billionaire. You don't need them anymore. Plus, you've got this year's ultimate seagoing super toys. First released in 1972, 40 years on, the jet ski is still the undisputed hooligan of the high seas. For the billionaire who thinks he's above it all, well, six inches above it all, then the 40 mile an hour hover pod is the only way to fly. Disliked by captains and crew alike, the super slide is every little big kid's dream. Big kids with 130,000 pounds to spare, that is. The billionaire life encapsulated in one fabulous toy, full of ups and downs and spins and swoops. For the wealthy flyboy at play, the fly board is guaranteed to raise pulses and eyebrows across the marina. Now, to mere mortals, this cutting-edge contraption may look like a submarine, but no, they'd be wrong. It is, in fact, an underwater aeroplane. The Super Falcon can fly to depths of 120 meters, and it's all yours for one easy installment of $1.7 million. But even underwater soaring can become boring eventually, and at this point, the lonely new money billionaire looks to his household for company. So they end up having to invite their members of staff, you know, mostly their decorators or designers, their personal chefs, to spend the holidays with them. But of course, it's always on their terms. And servicing this whole billionaire staff knees up, yet more personnel are brought in to cater for all on board. The last thing they want to see is somebody that's frumpy. They want somebody who's young, vibrant, attractive. She needs not to be oversized because if you're a size 12 to 14, it's very difficult to do your job in a correct manner. You hear all sorts of stories of um, stewardesses and captains, to be very honest, as well as stewardesses and owners. I think it's quite a common trap for girls to fall into. And those stories tend to end with the stewardess being on the streets, to be honest, and losing her job. <laughs> but of course, it's not just the stewardesses and, let's be fair, stewards servicing the boat-bound billionaire. A whole industry caters to their demands. And in Cannes, expats Ellen and Gabby have set up a fruit and veg business, catering to the appetites of the super-rich. This is our fruit and veg fridge. And all our fruit and veg is prepared at temperature. Well, at a constant temperature. A client one day asked us to send her some papaya fruit down to Sardinia. So we had to charter a private jet just to put the fruit on board. The pilot wasn't too happy. We actually get asked to send our fruit and veg to the Maldives. Where have we been? Seychelles. So Martin, yeah. At the Caribbean. So we send a lot in winter. We, we, we export a lot. Oh, morning, oh, shoo -shoo. Oh, oh, yeah. We have a lovely in-house florist called Shushu. 
Um, he's divine. He just does. He'll bend over backwards to help you. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> I love my job. Yes, of course. 26 years I make this job. Yeah. He's really lovely and the boats adore him. He goes on to the boats. He'll talk through with the chief stewardesses and he also comes on board some of the yachts with us and places the flowers on board for them so the girls don't have to do anything. <laughs> Every time I'm very happy. As party planners to the hyper-wealthy, Heidi and Bruno are accustomed to providing immediate gratification to some of the world's most demanding guests. Mega yacht owners, when they decide to organize a party, it's last minute. It's always last minute. The team is the key, and they do work under pressure, and uh, they know his style, which can get a little erratic. Céline, comment que ça se fait que je suis pas au courant de ça? Moi, je lui mets tout sur un tableau écrit. T'as un problème? Je te le dis que t'as un problème. T'es un fou? T'es un fou? Tant tu savais que tu fallait que tu sois là-bas à deux heures, et t'es encore là? Mais c'est des, des malades. Ils, ils, non, mais ils vont pas bien. Ils vont. The pressure is on as Bruno and Heidi prepare a huge boat party fit for a princess. It's a 21-year-old. She's having a birthday party. Uh, she expects a lot. She's pretty demanding. Well, the whole family is pretty demanding. Um, red party. Red. Their Russian client wants a six-course dinner with fine wines for 30 guests. They've insisted on a top DJ from London, dancers from Paris, and fresh lobsters from the bottom of the sea, all to be on their yacht by 8 p.m. this evening. They are not um, leaning towards French cuisine. They're looking for um, good quality, fresh, and they do tend to have a lot of courses, and meals do take, tend to take a long time. The Russians might not say bon to French food, but vino is a definite oui. Uh, this one is a cuvee very rare. It's uh, from Champagne Blanc de Blanc, vintage 2002. And this is a golden, a real gold uh, label. And uh, Champagne, it's uh, the, the, the top cuvee uh, from Rodrer. It's a crystal, but uh, pink, which is quite rare. But uh, for the big occasion, it's, uh, it's the one we suggest. We try to help them to, <laughs> to spend their money. But often we have to be expensive for, it, for, them to for them to want it. If it's not expensive, mm. they won't want it. We have something interesting that we use a lot for our clientele on the boats. This is the best, the best seller. It's real gold on it, huh? it's very nice. Suddenly there's a problem. The DJ is stuck in the UK. It's not a problem, the plane. It's not grave. They take another plane. It's for this evening. Mais il faut absolument. Ils sont coincés, ils sont coincés, ils ont perdu les bagages. Ils ont le transit de Beyrouth, les bagages, ils ont le bagage à Roissy. C'est le DJ de London, le one we always have. Oui, tout est en train de l'eau. Ok. Combien est-ce que c'est pour un privé de flight Avec le. Demande le prix de. Demande le prix pour. Il doit être ici, mais ça ne peut pas être quelqu'un d'autre. Nobody else. Et qu'est-ce que les danseurs, les cinq danseurs de Paris, sont-ils encore venus Raoul Je pense, je, pense, je pense que tu peux trouver un... We had one client who arrived uh, with her baby on, and was going to her super yacht and she forgot her baby monitor. Um, so we... doesn't seem like a problem to you or I, but we were, we were said we will go and buy... No, she didn't want to bought one, she wanted her own. So I had to charter a jet to Moscow to get her baby monitor. The baby monitor arrived and uh, life continued. <laughs> Four hours till deadline, and now it's all hands on deck for a mad dash down the coast to the client's boat. Go, go, go. Pressure, the boat's going. Everything is packed. Now, next stop, Monaco. I feel really at my best when I feel that pressure. It's like a drug. Here we are in marvelous Monaco. The boat is, uh, is here. We only have a small window of time where we have to get everything on board before it leaves the quay. All very exclusive, all very private, and all surrounded by bodyguards. It's a very discreet industry. In a funny way, these boats are so showy, it sort of contradicts everything that, that they want to be. So we have to keep it low key. We arrive, we install, we exit, um, and wait for the next project. Coming up. Not content with peer pressure at sea, competitive billionaires head for the skies. When somebody feels good about spending their money, there is no limit to what you'll spend. It's very, very addictive. So once you start flying private, 
you will never stop. And the big thing now is you have your own Airbus with a bedroom, with showers, with a gymnasium, and probably this, you know, there's probably a golf course in it now. To the outside world, the billionaire lifestyle is one of endless pleasure. They have yachts and they have private jets, but flying toys, like all fabulous playthings, are only for the deepest of pockets. Price could be anywhere from $3 million to $100 million. Have operating costs that run anywhere from about $1 million a year to about $5 million a year, depending on the size and how much you use the airplane. If you're flying in a private jet, that sets the scene. It's an unspoken sentence. But I'm for real. I've got money. I can get a deal done. Well, from what I can tell from my uh, several experience on private jets was that mostly it creates an enormous amount of stress. I was once flying back from Czechoslovakia and I was offered a lift by this billionaire who had his plane to himself and was being very kind to the rest of the guests and said, I'll give you a lift back. Well, all the people who took British Airways got home in two and a half hours and sort of four and a half hours later, we were still circling around Gatwick. At least when billionaires are delayed, they're not stuck by the loos with their knees around their ears. To the high net worth traveler, flying is a world of private airports and personal service where they are the only customer. Hello? Katinka, hello, it's June. Hi, June, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Just checking that you're on your way and the traffic's okay and everything's fine. Everything is fine. We should be ready in about 15 minutes. Fantastic. Well, I'm okay. here, I'm ready, the plane is in position, so we're just waiting Great. for you and Rue to arrive. Great. It's June's job to care for her customers' every creature comfort. On board today, Miss Katinka Niku and her traveling companion, Rue. Hi. The Rottweiler who was born with a silver spoon in his jaws. Hi. It's very, very addictive. So once you start flying private, you will never stop. Giving up that private jet, <laughs> that's the hardest thing to do. We've got the aircon on for you, so it'll be nice and cool in there. There are clearly children who fly around on private jet the whole time. I have a friend whose daughter was once flown on a commercial airline, and, and she said, you know, Daddy, are these all your friends? Um, she'd never seen 300 people on the same plane before. This is the first day of the birthday week. First day of the birthday week. Are we going to celebrate all week? As a jet salesman to the super-rich, New Yorker Steve Vassano lives the lifestyle of his customers. I love my life. I have the most fantastic life. I have the you know, best girlfriend, I have the best friends. I, you know, I live, I work in a fantastic environment. After all, if you can't be them, join them. Dress saint normal. Unfortunately. Slutty chic. Slutty chic, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to fly back to London no. to go to the office today. Ever the businessman, for Steve, it's always work before play. He's off to make money. Did you hit 40 million or is it just a little? Steve is one of a handful of go-to guys if you're a billionaire looking for a jet. Because he wants his ultra-high net worth customers to come to him, he's opened a retail environment they just can't resist, complete with a jet trading desk. Hey, how's you been? Good to see you. Man. But the real kicker is his billionaire-friendly mega app, the Multi-Millionometer. What do you think the budget is that you'd like to stay around? Quarter 10 to 15. Super successful people, super wealthy people, super powerful people. There's one thing they love to do is talk about what they do and who they are. And, you know, if you ask them the right leading questions, they just pour it out. Can you run quickly a comparison on the operating cost? Yep, they're incredibly close operating costs and you get an airplane that is 20% bigger in cabin. So it's still and, close to the same and amount. acquisition price, uh, what's the difference between both? Well, that's significantly more. They will spend $10 million on buying an asset, but they will decide to fly economy instead of business class on an on a airline jet because they can save $300. Because there's a big difference between enjoying your money and wasting your money. And when somebody feels good about spending the money, there is no limit to what you'll spend. Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars. Steve started out selling to the original jet set. I was really fortunate to sell a jet to Frank Sinatra. It was an unbelievable opportunity. And when you talk to somebody like that, it gives a feeling of really accomplishing and you're really proud of what you're doing. So let's look at the comparison of the two airplanes from a schematic standpoint. 
Steve's client has a relatively modest $13 million to spend on a second-hand eight-seater jet. Born salesman Steve knows the power of one-upmanship and heads next door to show exactly what a $300 million jet looks like. So come on in here and you can uh, experience actually uh, wow. a little bit bigger than the plane you're looking for, but um, wow, wow, wow. it actually puts you into the space, so it's, uh, it's a little bit more... Uh, you need to do still a lot of work before I can afford that, so uh, Steve... <laughs> Keep doing it, that's okay. I have a lot more than you got here. <laughs> so come on in here. So have a seat. Thank you. Uh, oh, one fantastic cabin. This is an exact replica of a uh, Airbus 319 corporate jet. This airplane probably new is about 85, 90 million dollars. A little bit more than what you're looking for, but it could be your second step. <laughs> third step, third step. I hope you're right. <laughs> Me too. So. By the time you have 600 people on your payroll who travel with you because you can't go anywhere without two personal chefs and six PAs and your financial manager and your tax consultant, um, so then you need a Boeing, you know, you need an Airbus. And the big thing now is you have your own Airbus with a bedroom, with showers, with a gymnasium, and probably this, you know, there's probably a golf course in it now. Let's go check into the wow. dining room <laughs> of the Airbus uh, or the conference room. And it actually extends even further to the bedroom of the airplane. No more, Steve, no more. Yeah, you, you don't want to upgrade yet? <laughs> billionaires may claim their jets are just time-saving business tools, but being billionaires, they can't resist a little competition. In 2008, American billionaire Steve Wynn took private jet ownership to a new level when he decked out a Boeing 737. One is talking more about new money than old money and culture where visible wealth is important. Speaking of which, one year later, Wynne was trumped by Donald, who took to the skies in his own Boeing 757. You'll notice the seatbelts, as well as everything else, are 24 karat gold plated. Then roaming Roman Abramovich claimed the laurel, proud owner of his very own Boeing 767. But in 2007, there was a new sultan of bling, Prince Al-Walid bin Talal Al Saud. His Airbus A380 is estimated to have cost over $500 million, once his taste had been accounted for. But soon, of course, there will be one still better. I think if someone developed a supersonic aircraft, I know a lot of people that would be interested in buying one. If super yachts are about billionaires playing host to privileged guests, then the private jet is the perfect place for the billionaire to entertain himself. You can do whatever you want on a corporate jet because nobody's there to watch you. Well, if you own the aeroplane, it's your orgy. You know, you do what you like in the back. You smoke cigars, smoke cigarettes, get drunk, smash the place up. You can't really throw the TV out of the window like a rock star unless you're on the ground. The jets are furnished, often at a cost of millions, to meet the owner's personal needs. And we've seen in the sort of larger 747s and 777s, you see owners where they put in cinemas, jacuzzis, bedrooms, dining rooms. They've kitted it out in the interior design of their choice. So basically, the world's your oyster. And some people, you know, will just temporarily put um, a beach, a sand with folding chairs in the back of a plane. Um, some people from the Middle East will have a chair that's always on a magnetic compass that points to Mecca. But pilots must beware indulging the owner's every whim. The consequences can be fatal. And there is a story, true, of a boss of a big company who told his pilots he could not be late for dinner and they had to land. And they missed the runway, crashed, and everyone was killed. <laughs> Coming up, billionaire competitiveness gets out of hand. You have a car. Confessions of a car collector. This is a ridiculous addiction. And chaos in Knightsbridge. It's not all fun and games being a billionaire. On the plus side, you've got access to the most fabulous toys that money can buy. Not quite so wonderful is the constant reminder that there's always someone else out there with an even bigger and brasher play thing. 
for the super rich, there's a silly season for showing off. August. And while the Russian and American billionaires battle it out on the Med, another tribe of super rich migrate to Knightsbridge in central London. Within a two mile stretch, you can probably see 50 supercars. They've all got Arabic plates from Dubai, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. There's a lot of princes, a royal family, a lot of millionaires, a lot of billionaires, and it's just a great sight to see. It's fair to say that not everyone is thrilled the area's become supercar central. You need to move out and the way. You need to go that way so that the shuttle can blow out. We're completely overtaken by these incredibly expensive, vulgar, outrageously noisy cars. And it's just too much. And I know so many of the locals who are actually, they're leaving town because they can't cope with it. It's just horrific. It's a testosterone fueled showdown as very rich young men race very expensive fast cars in a battle to win over the admiring hangers-on. For many, it's about pulling power through astonishing horsepower. Between supercar owners, there's a lot of competition, so it's always a case of who can get their car featured on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, more, and how many hits they can get. And so you'd literally get girls coming up to the car and being like, hey, <laughs> like, what are you doing, kind of thing? I've seen one red Lamborghini have a number written on in lipstick on the windscreen. I'm friends with a few of the supercar owners, and they do appreciate kind of the attention they get from girls. I think the car is pretty good looking, very aggressive, so I, I, I like showing it around. We have Maseratis, we have McLarens, we have a Camaro, we have a, a GTR. We can show off as much as we like, create some noise. <laughs> All the toys here are top end, so when your Ferrari just isn't cutting the mustard, what are you going to do? Well, like Riyadh here, you have it painted gold, of course. It's quite expensive, but it's, it's cool. Finishing was amazing, so I just love it. Not the shyest of multimillionaires, Riyadh just likes to see his golden gas guzzler fawned over by the adoring masses. It's cool. I like seeing people smiling, entertaining people when they see the gold, so it's awesome, you know? And if anyone were to suggest it's perhaps just a little bit over the top... I'm five-time world champion in kickboxing. I'm original from Iraq, but I live in London. You know? These tricked-out me machines have become bigger celebrities than their multi-millionaire owners. Trending online is the Tron Lamborghini. <laughs> putting the austere in steering wheel, the velvet Ferrari. You do see a lot of personalized cars that have their own initials in the headrest, they have their initials on the car, and they really make it their own car. I had it wrapped and detailed exactly as I wanted. It was originally silver, but I had it done white with like the black and red detailing and the wheels and all that. Brand new, it was over just over 100 grand, but now it's probably about half that. Oops, even for the super wealthy, spending heaps of money to make your car less sellable, but you more attractive, well, it's an expensive way to go about the mating game. And not everyone is after a kiss and a quarter million pound lift home. Billionaires beware British bobbies and their weapons of mass humiliation. The annual Harrods Grand Prix is formula fun for the billionaire boy racers. The only trouble is the Sloan Street Straight isn't really a racetrack. Never mind, should polish out. Perhaps take the chance to get it plated platinum whilst you're at it. For the billionaire who prefers to marvel rather than mangle, there's a far less physical pain to be borne in high-end motor acquisition. 
If you want the contents of your garage to trump all competition, you must suffer the pain that hurts the hyper-rich deepest, the pain of becoming significantly poorer. It's August 2014, and the bids for this car, a 1962 Ferrari GTO, are increasing by a million dollars a pop. The world record for the most expensive car ever sold at auction is about to be broken. Last chance. You have a car. The mystery phone bidder has agreed to pay $39 million, that's 23 million pounds, for the Ferrari. It's a new world record and a huge sum to swallow. There is no doubt that it's very simple to track. There are results of auctions over the last three or four years, and one can see very clearly how the values of these cars have been shooting up and up and up. Historic motor cars have appreciated just over 450%, which is huge, absolutely massive. Blenheim Palace, Oxfordshire, and a high-end classic car auction has once again brought out the hyper-wealthy big hitters. 150 new money, 160, 170. 170 here in the room. Classic car auctioneer Chris Routledge is familiar with the new breed of big money buyers. There are some clients who will be quite nonchalant and will say, buy it. And that's an open-ended instruction to buy it. And if you've got another competing bidder who equally has an open-ended instruction to buy it, you do get fireworks. At 50,000, now 52. For the ultra-high net worth toy consumer, the competitive irritation of being pushed to astronomical bids by others equally determined is somewhat offset by a rather wonderful tax loop now working in their favor. On my left, I'm asking for 60. Wine, watches, and cars are known as deteriorating assets. Except they was actually looked and noticed that the only deteriorating asset has actually gone up in value massively in the last 10 years. But car collecting is not without its snags. Paul Bailey owns one of Britain's most valuable collections of supercars. It is just absolutely fantastic to come down here and think, wow, how cool is that car and how lucky am I to have one? Or 39. For Paul, when it comes to hoarding rich list runarounds, well, more... Ferrari Enzo is more... So this is my Lamborghini, my Aventador, Ferrari 360 Spider ..is even more. Cars that are in most collections, often they're locked away, wrapped up in cotton wool, people don't get to see them, they don't get driven, may literally just sit in someone's collection, gathering dust, waiting for the day when that person can double or triple or quadruple their investment. But Paul has succumbed to another affliction that can ensnare the super-rich car collector. My wife's uh, California. This is a 360 Challenge Stradale. But here's the problem. At which point does a quirky, horribly expensive passion turn a wealthy, sane man into a full-blown petrol head case? This is Volcano Red, pearlescent orange, metallic yellow. I'm not afraid of uh, a nice yellow on a car. Is it this point? Metallic silver. I needed to have a black one. How about now? 16M SLS Spiker. Paul is addicted to buying supercars. It's as simple as that. At least his wife, Selena, has a good grip on his mounting obsession. Well, you don't, surely you don't need that many cars. Well, you don't need that many shoes, you don't need that many handbags, you don't need a lot of things in life. But it is our passion, and we love to have the amount of cars we have, and hopefully some more in the future. What do you do when a new one comes out? You really try hard not to buy it, but then you think, well, I'll just buy one of those, and that's a really cool car to have. Porsche, Ferrari, and the rest will make sure that Paul's ravenous desire can never be sated, because Paul is their perfect customer. The dealers are telling me that the GT3 RS is coming out any moment now, and then that's going to be a car I'm going to have to have, because currently my GT3 RSs are manual and the new ones are PDK. This is a ridiculous addiction. 
in some ways, I think it, it is as bad as alcohol, drugs or gambling. Uh, I could probably have some sort of medical help from somebody. Paul's supercar habit would ruin most people, but as the value of his collection keeps on rising... F40, it's gone up seven times since I bought it. This is perhaps the only known addiction that pays for itself. In the end, every toy has its day. There will always be a newer, brighter bauble to tickle a billionaire's passing fancy. Are the super rich happier? Probably happier than the super poor. I mean, you know, you can safely say that. But we have to ask why the accumulation of wealth is the main driver in their life. In my experience, the more money people have, the more problems they have. Especially if you've come across a lot of money very quickly. Who am I now? People get trapped by the trappings of their wealth. Boats and their planes, it all have to be taken care of. And it isn't freedom at all. I think the very, very rich have always had something to prove. The thing that's pushing them forward is probably insecurity, making up for something their dad once said to them, some need to fulfill some desire to prove something to the world. So are they happy? No. <laughs> and that's what drives them on.